Hello, my name is Anthony Jones, and today I'm going to be talking about aesthetic flapless socket repair. Just as a very brief introduction, um, I'm from Spain. I graduated from the University of Bilbao in 2010, and I completed my implant postgrad in 2012. Since 2000, 2013, I'm living and uh, I'm working in Dublin, in Ireland, and my clinical practice is mainly dedicated to implants. I look after the surgery and the prostate of my patients. I've been on the other side of this uh, screen many, many times. I've been spending countless hours of my time looking at webinars from other surgeons and dentists all around the world. And I've learned a lot. So for me, it's a great pleasure to be here today on this side, showing my experience with you. Just to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music and we all understand what we're gonna talk about from the very beginning, okay? We're gonna talk about socket repair and to repair something, obviously there has to be a damage first, right? So on the right side of the screen, you're gonna see a simple socket classification where the type one socket, we have an intact bone and intact tissue. Type two socket is the type of socket we're gonna be discussing today, okay? So the buckle plate is either missing completely or damaged, but the soft tissue is there. And then the type three would be a more advanced case where we also have soft tissue recession. And on the top left side, you can see a clinical photo. And this is what a type two socket would be looking like basically. Once we take a tooth out, we have no buckle plate, okay? Even though we're gonna be talking about flat lace cases, this is just a, an illustration of what we would be expecting. In terms of treatment options, um, these three I think are the most commonly used techniques. The options are not limited to these ones. Um, I know there's other options, but these are the ones I would be using usually. And as a clinician, I like to have an open mind. I like to try different techniques and then see which one works better for me. Because in my opinion, to be evidence-based is just not to be doing that technique that has most papers or that technique that has most publications, but it's that technique that works best for each one of us because we all have different skills and every patient is different. So I think that it's important to have an array of different options and then understand which cases, in which cases we can use one technique or the other and get better results. We're gonna talk first very briefly because it's not today's topic, okay? But we're gonna talk about immediate implants with simultaneous grafting. So can we place an immediate implant in a type two socket? This is a male patient, he has two failing central incisors, and we can see that cosmetically they're not great. We have some PFM crowns here. We have some tissue recession. These crowns have been there for many, many years. And when we look at the CT scan, it's very difficult to see whether or not there's a buckle plate. It really does show like on the right central incisor, which is on the left side of the screen, there's an apical area and the buckle plate is most probably missing. And on the other side, we're not too sure. So in a case like this, we have to be really ready for the worst case scenario, and that is that either the buckle plates are completely gone, or when we are doing the extractions, the buckle plates are probably fused to the roots and they can break and come out. So therefore, when this complication happens, we're ready for it, and it's not a surprise. From an occlusal view, we can also see that those roots are very prominent on the buckle surface, okay? Not just the, the, the buckle plate is very thin, but once the teeth come out, even if we have a bit of a buckle plate, as the buckle plate will be completely dependent on the root, okay, the buckle plate will completely dissolve very, very quickly. And of course, we had to address that. This is what it would look like. So we still have one to place our implants in the right 3D position. Um, I can promise I was very, very gentle in doing the extractions, but still the buckle plates were, were gone or completely gone, okay. From an occlusal view, you can see also how just uh, the, the, the implants are placed in the right 3D position, but we can also see that the intra-implant or intradental bony peaks are a little bit more palatal than we would like ideally, and that's just because the roots are very prominent. And in a case like this, if we just graft a tiny slot of buckle plate that are missing, and we do not address that concavity, we will not meet our objective of having at least two millimeters of bone facial to those implants. So when we're gonna graft, we have to make sure that not just we meet these lines together, but we have to over contour our case, we have to over graft. And probably the most commonly used material for these cases would be a xenograft, a bovine material, which is very slow or actually non-resorbable, okay? We can mix it with our autogenous chips, which will create our graft osseoinductive, and it's gonna activate it. 
We can also use a JSON membrane, which is a pericardium membrane. Um, I think it's a great membrane for these kind of indications because it's a resolvable but very slow resolvable um, pericardial membrane. It takes about 12 weeks, so that's about three months before it's gone. So that gives us about three months of barrier function. And um, we, 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 we close the flap, we passive edit line C, but we don't aim to get a complete closure. Because by doing so, we're going to completely change our tissue morphology. We're going to have to advance, advance our flaps a lot. We're going to advance the mucogingival line, and we're going to end up with probably a cosmetic and a soft tissue problem on the facial aspect. You can see how nicely the flap was passivated. The central papilla is completely dragged down and sutured in a quite an apical position. Okay. And this is how the tissues are looking like three months, sorry, four months later. The implants are integrated. Um, the color of the tissues is not great. The mucogingival line, even though we didn't go for a complete closure, has been displaced. The papillas, the heights are not too bad, okay? And um, what we're going to do next is we're going to prepare a case for restorations. We placed wider healing caps. On the left side, I was missing a stock abutment, so I just simply used a temporary abutment with some composite. And then the case was finished straight away. There are a few ways to go here. You can use your temporary crowns and slowly sculpt the tissue, mold it, adapt it to the emergence profile you're looking for. But if you trust your technician, you have experience, you know what your temporary should look like, you can also go straight to finish, okay? And in a controlled way, we can get a nice emergence profile from day one, provided that the tissues are already there. This is our lateral view. You can still see that the tissues are not looking 100% like in the adjacent areas, but you also had to consider that the bone that's underneath there is probably still not bone. It's only been four months since we grafted with the, with the xenograft material. This is the occlusal view. And then this is uh, about six months after the fitting. So you can see how nicely the tissues have matured, how nice the papillas are looking, and even the mucogingival line, it looks like it has reestablished itself without doing much. The color is great, and that's it. The before and after. And a few key aspects to look at here. I think the main advantage of this procedure is that in a single procedure or single surgery, we tackle everything. So we do the extractions, we place our implants, we do the grafting, and there's no exposure of those implants needed in a few months. We can go straight to our temporaries or to our finishing crowns. It's fast, okay? So in about three months, as I say, we can start restoring. But the, the list of, of um, cons is, is quite long. So. First of all, I think it's quite a technically challenging procedure because we're going to try to do everything in one go. We had to place those implants in the right position. We had to graft and graft in the right position. We had to foresee what kind of resorption we're going to have. We had to foresee what kind of pressure we're going to have in the area and how that can affect our graft so that at the end of the procedure, we end up having enough tissue in the buccal, in the intrapapillary areas, and we have a nice emergence profile. Since we are flapping here, we're going to be advancing the mucogingival junction, and that sometimes can be a challenge, okay? We're going to be having some scarring, perhaps, a pillar recession sometimes, and the question is, is our bone, guarded bone regeneration successful? We don't know, because we're not flapping again to, to have a look, okay? On a second option, we're going to be looking at the early implant placement with simultaneous grafting. It's done in a very similar fashion to the first option, but different to, to the, the, the timing would be different here. We're going to take the tooth out first, allow for soft tissue closer for about six to eight weeks, and then we're going to do our graft. We're going to place our implant, do our graft, and close. We're going to have a look at another case. So in this case, it's the upper right central incisor that has to come out. The adjacent teeth are crowned. Um, the patient was not, was not looking to replace them, unfortunately. We had some gingivitis and poor margins, but that was not in our plan, so we just had to work with what we, we can. We can see a long root, an apical area, a very thin buccal plate, and I wasn't too confident I could place an implant and get enough stability here, because this is a 60 millimeter implant. I was only going to have about 4 millimeters of bone anchorage, and I decided to, to delay the case. This is the occlusal view at the very top of the crest, or the more coronal portion. We can see the buccal plate is quite nice and flat, which is good. But just if we go a few millimeters higher, okay, in the mid crystal layer, we're going to see that the buccal plate is quite prominent. So again, once we take the tooth out, that's going to resorb, and that's something we'll have to be addressing. 
So we did the extraction as gentle as possible. The buckle plate was intact. Eight weeks later, this is how things are looking like. And two things have happened here. The socket has closed, okay? So new tissue has formed in the area to close the socket. So that's additional tissue we have to work with when we are doing our, our procedure, when we are grafting, and when we are also restoring the implant. And also the buccal flap or the buccal tissue has thickened because as the buccal plate or the bone resolves quickly, the soft tissue will grow slowly into the area. And that's what's going to allow for the soft tissue in the buccal area to thicken up. And if we're able to mobilize all that tissue towards the buccal, when we elevate the flap, we're going to end up with a tiny bit of a thicker tissue than originally. So I think that this procedure or this approach works better for thin biotypes if we compare it with the immediate implant placement. This is our picture, 3D picture. You can see everything is pretty much as we predicted. The buccal plate is gone or nearly gone. Occlusal view, same thing. Buccal plate is nowhere to be seen. Front 3D view. And this is our implant placement. We know what's going to happen. We have it on our plan. So we're going to be grafting here. Correct 3D position of the implant. And the same way, we're going to use our Zerobone or above material. We're going to mix it with some autogenous chips. And then we're going to cover everything with a JSON membrane, which is stacked, it's sutured, and it's fixed. You can see the tags up there. And this is three months later. The tissues are looking pretty much the same as before the surgery, which is good. We cannot see much scarring or, or anything like that. The buckle volume is good as well. And this is the exposure procedure. Do it flapless, please. Don't be elevating papillas in this case because you can cause recession, you can cause papilla. The papillas when we adapt them over a healing cap might not be placed ideally, okay? And what we do is just a very simple crestal incision, as palatal as possible, okay? So that when we place our healing cap, all the tissue is pushed buccally. You can see the blanching in the buccal area and we don't need any excessive tissue in the palate. We have plenty of keratinous tissue. So we have to try to manage this so that when we're placing a healing cap, our tissue is pushed buccally to have just that extra bit of tissue. This is the case restored, again, straight away, no temporary crown, happy with the emergence profile, happy with the, the gingival margin, confident that the pillars, the pillars will be filling in. And we're gonna see now the CT scan. This is um, the 3D X-ray after the, the case was restored. You can see a nice volume of bone there. Not too sure how much of this is vital or it's just a purely xenograph maintaining volume. But anyway, that's giving support to our tissues. That's the occlusal view and that's the meat, um, meat root area where we can still see this a nice volume of, of xenograft in the area. I'm trying to track down this patient, bring him back for a one year review to take that photograph and show you how the tissues are looking like. But unfortunately, the patient has been moving places. He's bought a new house. And it's just becoming impossible to me to, to, to bring him back. Um, if we look again at the pros and cons, okay, I think the main advantage here is that the soft tissue has healed before we do the procedure. Okay, so as I was explaining before, the soft tissue has thickened and we have additional keratinous tissue. It's not, it's quite fast. We're just adding six to eight weeks to the procedure, okay, which is not too bad for a complex case like this. But if we look at the cons, I think the main one is that we have two surgeries. All the other um, challenges are pretty much the same. So the, the, the technical difficulty, advancing the muckle gingival junction, possible scarring, papillary recession, again, the GV is successful, we're not too sure. But in my hands, in some cases, what I see that after we take the tooth out, if changes in the socket morphology occur very rapidly, it can be actually a challenge to build up the tissues to look like the original um, site. So sometimes an immediate implant placement can, can overcome that problem. And now we're gonna get deeper into today's topic, which is the socket repair with delayed implant placement. So again, we're gonna, um, you just have the picture of, the, of a type two socket here, okay? And um, there's many different ways of doing this. I think one of the first group perhaps describing a technique to, to repair such sockets was Dennis Turner's group. And they called it the ice cream cone technique. So basically what they were doing is they were extracting the tooth, all flapless. They were placing a membrane underneath the buccal uh, tissue just to get our, 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 our barrier function in the area. So filling the socket with uh, a bone material and closing up. I tried this technique 
Um, some of you have perhaps as well, and in my hands, it has some limitations. I find it difficult. If we're going to be using uh, a custom made membrane or a, a procedure specific membrane, which is similar to the one you see on the illustration, it would be quite a quite a rigid membrane. And we are, when we are placing it in the socket, we're not too sure of the, of the defect morphology. We're not too sure how much of the defect, defect we have covered. And if we're going to get complete coverage of a graft, if you have a look at the image on the right side, you can also see that that membrane is placed inside of the socket and it's placed underneath the bone. So from, from immediately from, from this moment, we're losing volume there. We're not grafting to the full potential of the socket. And in the other hand, if we're going to use a, a soft membrane, like a JSON membrane or, or a collagen membrane, it becomes very difficult to adapt a membrane into the socket if we just try to stick it in, because easily it's going to get uh, wrinkled, it's going to fold once it gets wet with blood, it's difficult to, 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 to keep them in place. And we're not too sure how the memory will, will or, or where it's going to end up being once we, we graft the socket with our, with our ball material. Now you're going to see just a quick animation of how I overcome this problem. Um, I'm not obviously the only one doing this technique, but uh, it works very, very well. So let's go. Here you're going to see a, a, an extraction socket. So that's pretty much the outline of the bone defect. And what we're going to do in a flapless way without lifting papillas, we're going to, through the socket, very gently elevate the tissue all around the defect in a full thickness way. That's going to be creating a space or a tunnel. And then with a couple of stitches apically through the socket, we're going to slide our membrane into that space so that the mem membrane is taking that space between the tissue and the bone. And that will give us a perfect coverage and a perfect seal of the socket. In this case, um, this patient will be losing the upper left central incisor, and I'm going to see you, show you a video just to, to see how the technique is done. Okay, and uh, here you can see the 3D X-ray, the 3D views. It's quite a complex case to start with. I wouldn't uh, advise for a new starter to, to start take, taking these cases with this technique because you can see it's not just the pocket plate that's miss, missing but there's a large 3D defect, a large crater of bone all around the tooth. And it's also affecting the lateral incisor a tiny bit, okay? But anyway, we're gonna show the video. I'm gonna talk you through it, just to, to have like a step-by-step -step of the technique. Sorry. So with, goes without saying the extraction has to be difficult. In this case, it was loose, so easy PC. We're gonna clean out the socket. There's lots of granulation tissue here. So with a lot of patients, we're going to just scrape and scrape and scrape and clean out all that granulation tissue until it's clean. And now with this instrument, which is a curved periosteal elevator, we're going to start very, very gently with a lot of patients just lifting the, the mucosa or lifting the gingiva, full thickness all around the bone defect. And you're going to see how it takes a few minutes to do this and how the instrument has to go well beyond the bone defect, both apically and laterally, mesial and distally. You have to be calm, no nerves, or, 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 or not in a rush to do this technique because you don't want to cause any perforations or, or any damage to the tissue. And you can see how far, how far we're going with our, our elevator. We're not just looking at that tiny, let's say, the, 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 the buccal, ball, buccal wall um, dehiscence. We're going to go nice, apically and, and, and laterally with, with our instrument. By doing so, we're going to also cause a bit of mobilization of the tissues, which is fine. And now here you can see how we are confirming that buccal plate got, uh, loss. Once more, we're just going to check, make sure there's no adherences, make sure that everything is, is separated very, very well. And we're going to start introducing our sutures to, to fix the membrane. So we're going to take a bite apically, mesial first, through the socket, take another bite onto the membrane. This is adjacent membrane, by the way. Into the socket again and out through the similar or same area in apical. I'm going to use a resolvable suture ideally, OK? I don't want to be dealing with suture removal a few weeks later and try to you know, perhaps removing the, the membrane. And you can see the concept. We have a sliding suture there that's going to allow us to just slide and introduce our, our membrane through the socket. Once we've done one side, we're going to do the other one. 
Here I was using a 5.0 monocryl suture, which is my preference, and I'm using uh, quite a small needle. It's a 30 mil needle. I would recommend using perhaps a larger one because as we are taking our, our, our tissue bites very, very high up in the apex, sometimes it can be difficult to, 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 to find the, the, the needle in that socket. So if you can use a 16 or 90 millimeter, probably better. So we almost have it there. You can see how it's coming through apically. A bigger needle facilitates this procedure for sure. You want to make sure that everything is done nice and calmly. And here's a tiny problem. So I have my sutures have tangled up. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take one of them out and start again. It would be a great idea to have different color sutures because that would make the procedure easier visibility wise. And you have to also make sure that the assistant is not suctioning constantly and this, the patient is still and it's a peaceful <laughs> scenario to, to work in. Once we have the membrane sutured, we're going to gently introduce it into the socket and using our sutures, we're going to start to slide it upwards. So you can see how that's working, okay? You can imagine it can be difficult to insert a membrane like this into a socket if we're not helping ourselves with, with the suture. And sutures are, are, are tight, cut. Once the membrane is fixed apically, we have to make sure it's, it's facing the right way. It's not bent or it's not uh, too wrinkled. And then we start to extend it. And with our instrument, again, we're going to start to to, to, to make sure it's tucking in underneath the tissue and over the bone. This membrane is, is quite elastic, very thin, so it's actually uh, it's a great there's a great indication of using this uh, JSON membrane for, for this procedure. And once we have it uh, nicely positioned, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to also fix it because this one was quite a large dehiscence or bone loss. I'm going to fix it in a more coronal position again, measly and distally. So that we have four anchorages in the buckle to make sure that once we start to pack a socket, the membrane won't move too much. And that's gonna be one side done. Then after that, we're gonna do the other one. And here you can see the four sutures, two apically, two more coronally, and that membrane is now very, very well held. And we're going to start packing the socket next. A couple of details, very important here. You're going to see how I gently, I hold the membrane and I kind of put some tension on it because I don't want the membrane folding into the socket while I'm packing it with the bone. I want to keep it nice and extended. And then apically, you're going to see my Minnesota retractor is not just retracting the lip, it's pressing against the bone. As we have, re we have retracted the tissues quite a bit, we have reflected the tissues away from the bone. If we start just packing that bone up and up and up, easily that bone will overflow apically and it's gonna be placed into somewhere we don't want to. So just put your instrument up there to make sure that the tissues are against the bone and that's gonna contain where our socket will be filled up to. Again, with a lot of patience and care, we just pack, pack, pack. This is just max graft cortical cancellus. It's a human allograft. I'm not adding any other material here. And you can also start feeling how the socket is filling up because the soft tissues will start to kind of fill up and, and swell there. You have to be careful with how much you're, you're, you're fitting in because as the tissues are nice and reflected, the graft can, can, can be going laterally. You can see a clinical photo there. The socket is now filled. We have the membrane or that extra bit of membrane to cover the seal and uh, cover and seal the socket with. And now we're just going to start suturing that over the socket. A couple of sutures sometimes are necessary, but everybody's different. Sometimes two, three, four, depends on your needs. So you just nicely suture that um, membrane out against the palatal tissue, and that's going to seal our socket entrance very, very well. It's a procedure that in my hands usually takes about an hour to do, but I think it's well worth the time to get the results we expect in the, in the aesthetic spe uh, zone, especially. You can see also the bulk of, of bone underneath the, the gum, which is filling that really, really well. 
and I'm going to be using the same type of suture all the way around, which is the 5-0 monocryl. We should be finishing very soon now. And you can see how the suture is done. Comes through the pallet into the socket, bite on the membrane, and back towards the pallet. Like a sliding suture, basically. And that's putting some tension on our membrane, and it's just keeping everything well and contained well. Great. So, kind of finish here. Just checking that everything is, is tight. Tissues are, are, are good there, and that's our, our photo. Nice volume buccally, that's a frontal view. And we're just going to allow that tissue to heal by secondary intention. No papillas were ref reflected, no flap raised, and I'm going to move on. So I think some key aspects of this technique is that we are leaving it to heal in an open wound way. So we're not advancing the flap, we're just allowing it to heal by secondary intention. This is a pericardial membrane, which um, eventually, quite quickly, it's going to become, uh, or it's going to dissolve in the entrance of the socket. Um, new tissue will start to grow onto it. We'll get fibrin underneath holding our graft. And in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, we're going to start to see that entrance of the socket closing very, very well. And um, by doing so, we're going to end up having more tissue as well, because all that area, which could be about seven, eight millimeters in circumference, will will cover up with new, newly formed tissue, which is going to add us some additional tissue for, for a restoration and emergence profile. Why do I use max graft, which is a human allograft, and not perhaps um, a, a zero bone or a bovine material? If you're going to use a bovine material here, you have to wait a much, much longer period of time for the bone to, to be mature enough to place our implant. And most likely in 12, 12 weeks or so, in about three months, once that membrane is dissolved and it's gone, there's no more barrier function, the bone that's underneath will be extremely immature and you might get some soft tissue invasion as well. So my preference would be always to use a human allograft, which is my graft in this case. And then what to say about the temporary restoration. This is not really discussed too often, but I think it's a, it's a key element of our treatment as well. I think that the temporary restoration should, should avoid pressure completely in the area. We just, um, we're going to allow the open, open wound healing to heal in its way. If we stick something there, we stick a palm tick, whether it's porcelain, whether it's a, an acrylic material, we're taking space away from the tissue. And the first law of physics would be two bodies cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So no pressure and try to leave the area to heal on its own. In terms of uh, temporary restorations, um, another thing to, to say as well, there's a, a concept or, or there is this idea that a temporary restoration can maintain tissue, can maintain papilla. But what I find is that unless we have a nice, thick, solid bone underneath, the tissue will not be maintained by an external element. In this way, if we're going to create a nice bone volume with our, with our socket graft and our, and our membrane, the papillas can be supported by the chasing teeth and that volume we've, we've created or we are maintaining. And then your temporary, your temporary restoration at the most will preserve or it's going to maintain the shape. But by itself, it won't be preserving tissue for you. So that's a very important uh, concept to, to understand. Temporary restoration options. First one could be a Maryland, perhaps. Um, I never, ever use them. I absolutely hate Maryland bridges. In my hands, they don't work very good. Um, a few times I've tried them, they have just been debonding constantly. And uh, they can be expensive because the lab fees are quite high for such, uh, such um, appliances. And every time the, the, the Maryland is coming off, you're going to be using chair time to stick it back in as well. Also, throughout the different phases of the treatment, let's say we do the extraction graft and we place the Maryland. When the patient comes back to place the implant, we had to take it off. We had to clean out the cement, bond it back in. And then when we start the restorative phase, again, we had to be taking it off and all that. So it's a very laborious procedure. And I, I, I completely avoid Maryland bridges. I would either go for a denture, it's a, a regular acrylic denture. And in this case, I want to also stress that we had to allow the, the tissues to heal. So we're going to create or we're going to prepare a denture that's not putting absolutely any pressure into the socket. 
This is just a, a patient that got the tooth knocked out a couple of weeks ago, and you can see the soft tissue is still very immature. On the top right side, you can see how the denture was fitted. And if you give this to um, most technicians, they probably just stick a, a buccal flange or, or a piece of acrylic in that area, just putting pressure on the tissue to fill the space. But you have to understand that if you do that, you're not allowing the tissue to recover. And in the, in the bottom left, you can see how without any pressure, without doing anything, the tissues are looking much thicker, much fuller. And now the patient, which is going to be getting a block graft, is, has the tissues ready for it. And the same thing would apply to a socket repair procedure. You don't want to put any pressure on the socket and you want to give the tissue extra space to heal. My preference anyway would be an Essex retainer. This photo looks awful because it's just fitted straight after surgery. So there's a bit of bleeding there, but the concept is very simple. The upper left central incisor is missing here. So we create an Essex or a retainer that's similar to an Invisalign or an orthodontic retainer, which is placed a tooth in it. And this is a tooth bone restoration. You will not be putting absolutely any pressure onto the gums, okay? And that's important. For example, when we have very little occlusal space, space and it can be difficult to fit a denture. So my preference are Essex because they are quick to make and they're very reliable. Now, okay, we've, we've discussed the technique. We've discussed uh, the, the, the temporary restorations, the material selection. And I'm going to go through a few cases just showing how the technique might work and what kind of results we could expect. So this woman, she has a failing upper right central incisor. You can see just an excess of cement everywhere. This is a crown that keeps falling out. She has been to numerous dentists and they've all tried to cement it back. She even got a pharmacy kit where she's mixing her cement herself and just sticking it back together at home. So you can see all that cement. You can see the swelling on the tissues and the papillas. And just um, apical to the gingival margin, you can see also a root fragment piercing through the gum. We have a tissue, um, a tissue hole in the area or, 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 or tissue defect. But if we are managing our, our, our socket with our adjacent membrane, our bare material, as the member will be sealing the area, we can still go on and, 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 and prepare the case that way. If we have a look at the 3D x-ray, on the top left, you're going to see that the buccal contour is quite flat, which is good, okay? Lower right side, you're going to see how that crown and post are not following the axis of the root any longer. The root is completely snapped, and there's no buccal plate. As I was saying before, we have the little hole in the tissue, but we're just going to prepare a case in the same way I showed you on the video. We will uh, reflect the tissues away from the bone. We're going to place our membrane, fill it with a match graft, suture over, and this is how it's looking like. You can see the over contouring of the material on the buckle as well. You can see how that tissue has been pushed out. And this is two weeks later. Now you can start to see how the open wound healing is working there. The membrane is no longer to be seen. The membrane that's underneath the tissue is still there, obviously. So underneath the buckle plate, the membrane is there. But just in the soft or, 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 or the socket entrance, that bit of membrane that was exposed is just dissolved away. And you can see how the underlying bone granules start to show up. These little bits will exfoliate slowly. And what's going to happen is that slowly the soft tissue will just heal and, and seal over the, the socket. And what's going to be left or inside would be a nice closed um, environment for a bone graft to mature. This is four months later, and uh, you can see a very, very nice maintenance of the, the, the hard tissue architecture, both from an occlusal point of view and a cross section. And uh, these are the tissues at four months. The pillars are nice and maintained. We have actually gain on the height of the soft tissue. We have more soft tissue height than before. The monco gingival line is perfect because we haven't flapped and we haven't advanced it. And this is our implant placement. So you can see how the hard tissues on the buckle where we had a missing buc buckle plate are looking very nice. You cannot really see many loose particles or, or non-integrated graft. It's looking like a nice bleedy bone in the area. More than two millimeters hard, of hard tissue buckle to that implant, which is great. Suture with our, with our um, healing cap. And this is how things are looking three months later. Again, you can see we have an excess of soft tissue. And we can all imagine, we can all picture in our mind how that final crown has to look like. Right? Obviously, the gingival margin has to be more or less where that yellow line is. We have the papillas, we have the tissue thickness, the color. So why not just go to our final restoration? Again, once you have plenty of experience doing your provisional crowns, you know how they should look like. 
you can also um, train your, your, your technician to give you the perfect emergence profile from day one, and you can go straight to finish. This is how things are looking like. So this is our final crown, some tissue blanching, papillas are not too bad, and this is six months later. So you can see a perfect, perfect adaptation of the tissue to the implant crown. Papillas have filled in really, really nicely. The tissue color is great. And this is always my favorite view, the clusal view, in which we can see how a graft or how the volume we created or we are maintaining is doing over time. So you can see no collapse. You can see perfect contour of those tissues. This is our second case. And uh, this is a very young patient. She has an over erupted upper right one or upper right central incisor. It's over erupted because there's an apical area which is kind of putting pressure onto the root. It's making it fall down a little bit. The root also has fallen out a few times and it, it has been cemented back. And you're going to see a very, very thin soft tissue here. This is a very thin biotype. As opposed to the first case I was showing you, here you can see all the little vessels. The veins in the area, this is a very high demanding case. So we want to make sure we're extra gentle with the tissues. We want to make sure we're not causing surgical trauma that could affect the aesthetics. You can see also the color of the tissue buccally is not great. It's purpley, dark. That's indicating that there's a problem underneath for sure. We're going to look at the, we're going to have a look at the CT scan. Top right, top left, you can see the cross section. And if we're going to measure the socket dimensions, Buccal palatally are quite narrow, so we have about seven and a half millimeters. We cannot afford losing any tissue or any volume here. If this drops down to six and a half, seven millimeters, and we're going to place a standard implant, we could have a compromise of how much bone we have buccal and palatal to that implant. And then on the other side, on the right hand side, you can see the occlusal view showing the, the limits of that bone defect. So we are missing that buccal tissue, and our goal will be to recover that before we place our implant. The procedure is done exactly the same way, okay, careful extraction, degranulate the socket, clean and disinfect it, replace our membrane with our sutures, our max graft, seal the membrane, seal this socket over with the membrane, and this is two weeks later. You can still see that the buccal contour is actually still a little bit um, overcompensated, which is great. We have some more bulk than we had initially. The stitches are still there. These monocle sutures usually fall out three, four weeks after the procedure, which is great. We don't want very quickly or very fast resolving sutures. And same as before, you can see that the membrane is, is no more visible in the socket entrance. We can see some, some granules underneath. They're going to exfoliate, and they're going to slowly allow for the soft tissues to, to heal over. And this is four months later. So four months later, what are we seeing? We've seen on the right side some gain on the, on the tissue height, which is fantastic. We have nice papillas, which we haven't touched really. And from an occlusal view, we can see also that the buccal contour has been maintained very, very nicely. We can see some granules still in the socket entrance, but that's fine. When we are performing our surgery, we just take them, out, remove them. They're going to exfoliate on their own, if not. This is the 3D view, so we can see a perfectly flat ridge on the buccal. We are just missing one little thing, and that's that as there is no root, we don't have that root concavity, sorry, root convexity or root prominence we're seeing on the left central incisor, but it's very difficult or nearly impossible to obtain such a concavity, sorry, convexity once the root is extracted by doing a soccer grafting like this. So we're going to have to use other strategies to try to build up the tissues and try to get the similar emergence that, that we have on the contralateral side. Here we're saying we have a very young patient, we have a very demanding cosmetic situation with a very thin tissue. So why not go for a completely guided surgery where we don't have to elevate the flap, where we just do everything through a guide and we're going to be extra friendly to those tissues. So you can see our guide is seated here. We're going to drill through it. This is our drill on the left side and on the right hand side you can see the implant placed with a healing cap. When I'm doing guided procedures like this, I don't use a tissue punch because by doing a tissue punch you're going to be taking away a circumference of three, four, five millimeters of tissue. Instead, I just drill through the tissue, which will be, the drill will not be taking more, much of the tissue away. And you're going to see on the, on the right-hand side, once that healing cap is placed, that's actually pushing a little bit more tissue buccally. There's a bit of blanching there. So remember, we don't have a root there. We need some extra tissue to give us that support. Again, we're going to finish this case straight away, three months later. And occlusively, you can see that the, 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 the buccal prominence is perfect. On our frontal view, 
You can see the pupil is a little bit reddish, a bit swollen. The patient wasn't cleaning underneath the, the temporary denture very, very well, so the pupils are a little bit um, they're complaining a bit here. You can see some blanching, and then this is just one month later. So I'd like you all to appreciate the central papilla we have between the implant and the other central incisor, which is phenomenal. And the distal papilla is looking much, much better as well. The gingival margin is perfect. We have a nice contour buccally to show, um, to, to give us that emergent profile and tissue support. And again, if we have a look at it from the occlusal view, you're going to see that there's no collapse and it's, uh, there's not much of a difference between the implant site and the, the, the upper left central incisor. Now we're going to move on to the next case. I apologize for the photograph. It's not great, but I like to show this case. And in a minute, you're going to see why. So in this case, it's the upper left central incisor that has to come out. It's difficult to appreciate, but there's also a sinus tract or a fistula a few millimeters um, apical to the gingival margin. And if we have a look at the CT scan, you're going to see that this case is a bit more dramatic. On the top left, we're going to see how much one we are missing. It's not just the buccal plate. We're missing tissue mesial and distal and palatal to the tooth. And then on the bottom right, you're going to see how much tissue, hard tissue we're maintaining. It's just a very, very thin sliver of palatal plate. Everything else is eaten away. Luckily, the bony peaks on the adjacent teeth were maintained. So we're, still, we're talking still about a contained defect. You can see also how the post and core are completely um, piercing through the root. Okay, they're not, in, they're not following the path of the root. And that's why we have this big problem on the bone. <laughs> that's the way it's looking like. This case, or this treatment was done 15, 20 years ago. The patient had had no symptoms until the crown started to break but you can see clearly that the post was not placed in the right position. Same thing, we just do our, pro we, we, we continue with the protocol, we place our membrane with some sutures, we, we fill the sucker with the max graft, we seal over, and again, you can see some overbuilding, some overcontouring of the site. We place, in this case, a denture, the patient preferred this over the Essex, but again, the denture should not be putting any pressure onto the socket. We wanna leave it, we wanna let that heal on its own. And then the patient disappeared for over a year. She had some other things going on. Not, um, it wasn't in her agenda to come back to get the treatment finished, but anyway, she eventually showed up. It was about 15 months after we had done the graft. Oral hygiene is not great, but anyway, we have, we can look at, or we can see a few things here. First, the papillas are well-maintained. We again have some growth of tissue or some, some additional tissue height, which was not there before. The color is perfect. From an occlusal view, we're going to see that it has got completely flat. So that means we're maintaining as much one as we can. Okay, We don't have that bulk or the complexity the other central incisor has. But that's simply because the root is gone. Now on the CT scan, again, you can see the buccal plate is nice and flat, which is great. We have sufficient bone for the implant placement. And this is what I like about this case. This was done with max rift alone. Some people would think that allografts have the potential to resolve or they would dissolve onions you are using something or mixing it with, with a bovine bone, for, bovine bone, for example. And here you can see perfect integration of the graft, perfect newly formed bone. The buckle plate actually looks incredible. You cannot see a single bone particle there. The color and the texture of that cortical plate is beautiful. This is the frontal view. Again, it's like that bone has been there always. We have done our implant, we place our healing cap, and just a little mention to the, the flap design here. Um, you, you, you probably all heard that um, vertical releases in the front or in the steady care can cause scarring, and that can be obviously a, a challenge or it can be a cosmetic issue. But um, I think the great thing of taking photographs and taking photos and, and documenting your cases is not just to, to show them and, and for educational purposes, but also to go back on them and see what things could we have done differently to get a better outcome? So here you can see on the mesial aspect, okay, the flap is perfectly adapted. So I can guarantee you if you adapt your flap nicely, it's very, very rare for you to have a scar. Whereas in the distal release incision, you're gonna see how there's a bit of an overlap of those two flaps, or better said, of the buccal flap over the, the distal tissue. And that's where we might, or we could, that's where we could end up with, with some scarring. This is three months later. 
great tissue co color, volume, everything is doing very, very good. And again, we're going to go straight to finishing the case. You can see some tissue blanching, fillers still had to mature a little bit, filling those spaces. And that's three months later. We only waited three months and look at the difference. But fillers are perfect. Buccal tissue is looking incredible. And as I was uh, explaining there, we just have a tiny bit of scarring distally. But um, in a patient that has a medium or a normal lip line, this would usually not be shown. So I rather preserve the papillas and have a tiny little bit of scarring here instead of compromising the papilla. This is our, our view from the occlusal aspect. Again, you can see the tissue is perfectly flat. There's no tissue loss or concavity or anything like that. We don't have that bulk that the adjacent tooth has, but there's other strategies which we're going to talk in a minute to overcome this, this problem, okay? But from a, a frontal view, if we just go back to the, to the previous image, you're going to see that that difference in, in convexity and, and tissue volume will not really become much of a problem. Next case, um, there's a, a little challenge, added challenge in this one. We have an existing implant. This implant was done a few years ago, but um, for some reason, he only still had a temporary crown in it. And the upper right one or upper right central incisor has an internal resorption. The tooth is failing and it has to come out. So what's the biggest challenge here? If we're going to go in, open up a flap, do our immediate implants, a whole lot, what's going to happen with that papilla? There's high chances it's going to resorb. The papilla is already a little bit more apically positioned than the contralateral one because, just face it, we have an implant there. There's no tooth any longer. So if we're going to have two adjacent implants. We have to make sure that our surgical technique is very friendly with the papilla and we're going to keep as much papilla as possible. 3D view, we can see the internal resorption. We can see also how nicely the other implant is doing, which is great. The implant is placed nice and palatal, it has great tissue. So the surgeon that was looking after this case did a great job. I didn't do it myself, so <laughs> that's good. And um, the buccal plate is very, very thin or it's missing. And a lot of the times these cases with internal resorptions also present ankylosis. So when I did the extraction, obviously the buccal plate gone. We can see the tip of our instrument once we've done the, the reflection of the tissues. We're going to do the same uh, procedure. We're going to follow the same protocol. We place our membrane. We now are ready to fill the socket with a max graft. Once it's filled, we're going to suture over. And in this case, as we already have an existing implant, which had a temporary crown, um, the, the, the temporization was done using that implant and just using a temporary crown with a mesial pontic to cover the area. You might think this pontic is deep and, and trying to preserve tissue. It's not really. It's just flush with the tissue, just allowing enough space for new tissue to grow over the membrane and over our, our graft. And I was telling you, I don't like bonded restorations like Maryland's. A month later, the patient came back because it had fallen out. But it gave me the opportunity to take a photo, have a look at the tissues, make sure everything was nice and clean. And a month later, you can still see how great this uh, socket graft is doing. You can see the membrane is, is, is not visible anymore. The granules, as usual, is going to exfoliate. It's going to allow for the tissue to grow in. And you can see a very, very nice buccal contour over this uh, socket graft. This is a frontal view. You can still see the sutures. Sometimes a month later, uh, four or five weeks later, they can still be there. No problem at all. They're going to end up falling out. And that's four months later. Main thing to say is that Things are looking identical, so very little changes. Papilla is nearly the same. Buccal contour, tissue color, everything is doing great. This is the occlusal view. Again, we still have a nice prominence of that uh, socket. We haven't lost much volume. We're going to place the implant in a guided uh, way again. We're going to try to be as friendly with the tissues as possible, try not to elevate any papillas, keep everything intact. And uh, this is how it's looking like. This case, for me, finishes here because I done the implant, he went back to the restoring dentist and I'm still waiting for, for the case to, or the photograph to, to come back to me. But I like to show it because we're working beside an implant, so we had to be really, really careful there. And I like to show it to show really how the soccer graft is performing after four or five months. where well, you can see beautiful vocal contour. It looks like there's still a root in there, really. <laughs> now, this is the second last case. This is a gentleman, he has um, a broken upper right central incisor. Today it's all about central incisors, <laughs> sorry about that. Behind the tooth you can see a little ortho wire and you can see also a diastema, clearly fractured, nothing we can do about this case, has to come out. 
The tissue thickness of the biotrap is not too bad, but we have long and thin papillas, quite triangular teeth. So again, we had to be efficient um, re uh, repairing our tissues. We had to be efficient and uh, uh, gentle with those tissues to make sure we're not causing any harm. You can see our, our, our CT scan here. There's an apical area, fracture, which is called vocal plate loss. That's how it's looking like. Loads of granulation tissue. We're gonna all clean up very, very nicely. You can see the root, which is fractured. This is a good repair kind there. And again, the depression or the, the, the concavity in the tissue, once we place a little bit of pressure on it, confirming that the buckle plate is gone. Same protocol, our, our, our JSON membrane fixed with a few sutures, socket sealed, max graft inside, and you can see how nicely we've over contoured the area. You're going to also notice there's, there's quite a strong frenum there. A lot of people will ask me, would you not take off or would you not um, address that before you do any surgery? Well, actually, this frenum is attached to a nice thick band of keratinous tissue, which at the same time is attached to the bone. It has never caused any issues, so I don't really do anything about it. It's different if we don't have too much attached gingiva and our frenum is creating a pull, but in this case, that's just anchored nicely into the tissue and the bone, so we don't really have to do much. Two weeks later, you can see the socket is nearly closed, so the stitch is still there. From a frontal view, you can see all the additional tissue that has it's starting to grow into the area, okay? So eventually we're gonna end up with all this new tissue right here, and that's four months later. On the right side, you're gonna notice that from an occlusal point of view, we have lost a little bit of volume buccally. Um, this happened, I think, because the distance between the other two roots is quite large. So we have quite a large front of, 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 a, of a large front where the, the bone was missing, okay? So even though we feel that nicely, the lip pressure, um, eating, brushing, there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of movement and pressure in there, and that can cause a tiny bit of uh, volume loss. And it doesn't really matter if you're going to use a zinner graft. It's not about the material we're using. It's just about how we are protecting the graft with a resolvable soft membrane. It's going to be under pressure, and sometimes that could lead to changes from our initial grafting procedure. Anyway, we still have beautiful bone. We have nice height, nice um, bone thickness or, 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 or buccopalatal dimension to place our implant. As the tissue before we go into place our implant, nicely closed and sealed. We're going to see again, there's absolutely no um, remnants here of, of a particular material. Everything is really, really nicely remodeled and incorporated into the bone. The implant has beautiful heart tissue on the buckle, more than two millimeters. And since we were discussing, we had some buckle um, bone loss or, or, or adaptation in the area, we're going to have to boost the tissues. And this is the way or the best way to try to recover that tissue and try to create an emergence that's going to mimic the other adjacent tooth. It's a nice thick bit of connected tissue from the palate. And what we're going to do is we're going to just suture it underneath the buckle fla flap and then we're going to close everything. So instead of going back and doing some more bone grafting, which possibly, most probably, it's going to end up or, or, or it's going to have the same fate as our initial one. We just add a bit of tissue that's incredibly stable. It's very, very predictable in terms of tissue volume long term, which is going to be a connected tissue. So we switch you nicely. And now here you can see how nicely the flap is adapted. It's difficult to see actually where the, the incision lines are. And in a case like this, very rarely you're going to get any scarring. Three months later, tissues are looking beautiful. We have reestablished the buccal contour with our connected tissue graft, beautiful tissue. Again, we can go straight to finishing the case because we have the pillars, we have the buccal contour, we have, we have everything we need there, really. This is the fitting, okay? And you're gonna see some open spaces around the pillars. The upper right lateral incisor was bonded a little bit to close that tiny diastema. And uh, this is a occlusal view, and you can see beautiful volume there, fantastic outcome. And patient comes back eight months later for a follow-up and you can see the papillas are absolutely perfect. But you can see one more thing here. You can see that the gingival margin, gingival margin, margin has actually migrated coronally. And why is that happening? We haven't done anything after restoring the case. This is a, a tiny complication or a consequence we can have sometimes to connected tissue grafting. The graft can actually, you can see the before and after here, how when we fitted the, the, the crown, the gingival margins were, were equal and now how that gingival margin is a bit lower. So 
Uh, a side effect of the connected tissue graft symptoms can be that over time, not too sure why this is happening, but more and more dentists are, are, are showing cases like this and sharing this, this little complication with, with, with others, is that the tissue can actually start growing and you can see how that's kind of bulking out and, and, and growing over time. This has been only eight months. Luckily, we have quite a low lip line, so for the moment, it's not a cosmetic issue, but this could make us rethink twice, really, when we're going to use a connected tissue graft because I think we have to justify it very well instead of just placing connected tissue grafts to every patient and perhaps end up having these kind of complications down the road sometime. And here with this case, we're going to finish the presentation. It's the very last one. <clears throat> it's actually also the most complex case of all I'm going to show tonight. And in this case, we have the upper left central incisor Again, you can see the ortho wire underneath. The tooth was traumatized. The patient um, at work, he had, uh, or he, he, something fell on his head, a box or something. He, he bit on his teeth really, really hard. And that tooth was luxated, got loose, necrotic. You can see the color change and it didn't recover. So this was about two months after he had the accident. Somebody had bonded the tooth just to keep it there. The patient was willing to, to get the implant. We can also see we have a very thin biotype here. And this is actually a type 3 socket because we also have a soft tissue component. We have recession of the soft tissue. So that's adding a little more, a little bit of a bigger challenge to a case. We also have some diastemas. I'm mentioning this because at the end of the case, when we're going to see, look at the restoration, this is something that's going to come back again. Let's have a look at the CT scan. Now it's quite dramatic here. In the 3D view on the lower left side, you can see how there's a massive buccal plate loss. The root is completely just floating in soft tissue. Okay, it has lost all the bone around it. It's just keeping the buccal plate. And it's also, the bone loss is also affecting the lateral incisor. Now, this um, has to be very, very carefully addressed. We had to look at the lateral incisor and see whether or not we can keep it. But from the 3D x ray, it's not looking great. It has lost the bone attachment on the mesial aspect all the way to the apex. And you can see that on the upper right image as well. You can see how that huge dark halo is actually taking or, 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 or it's covering those, those two roots in the area. What are our treatment options? Um, are we going to do an immediate implant? Anybody confident? Probably not. Um, there's not much bone there to anchor an implant into. We have massive bone loss, so I, I, I think that's completely out of the question. Are we going to take the tooth out and do an open flap guided bone regeneration there? And uh, if so, what's going to happen with the tissues if that graft is not done meticulously, if the result of the graft is not perfect? We're going to risk huge recession mesial to the lateral incisor if we lift up the pilla. And if we don't get a perfect bone grafting uh, outcome, we're going to have a massive problem. What is the next option? Can we just take the tooth out, allow for the soft tissues to heal, and then do a, a graft? If you take this tooth out and do nothing straight away, you're going to end up also with a massive resorption, huge collapse. The morphology of the socket will, will, will change completely, and then it's going to be a huge challenge to, to build it up. And perhaps here we can look at doing a flapless type 2 socket graft, which I've described already. And that's precisely what we, we chose. The next question is, are we going to keep, are we going to extract one or two teeth? What's going to happen with the lateral incisor? Are we confident we can keep that there and still graft inside it? Let's have a, a, a closer look at the, at the peak view, right? Upper right one is, 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 is gone for sure. Absolutely no question about that. What about the upper left two? Well, the downside or the negative aspect is that interdental bone loss is gone. We know that. But the tooth is vital, which is good. It's not moving and Probing, now this is key, okay, very, very important. Not just rely yourself on a CT scan and an X-ray. Probing is normal. So what's, what is that telling me? It's telling me that the ligament and the suprachiasmatic fibers and the papilla are still attached to the tooth. So that's telling me that perhaps if we just um, take the tooth out, we do a bone graft, we can actually also perform a guided tissue regeneration around that tooth and recover the attachment of bone easily. A lot of people, even myself, in, in, in some cases, if we're going to be grafting, we cannot really graft beside a root that has this kind of bone loss. But if we're going to do it in a flapless way with the, with the described technique, this can, 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 can work, actually. Here you can see all again the bone loss. 
and let's have a look at the, the, the procedure after it's done. So the same, same, absolutely same procedure or same protocol I followed before. We do our, our extraction, we place our membrane, max shaft suture over. You can see the papillas have not been touched. The distal papilla or the mesial papilla to the lateral center is intact. We haven't touched it, okay? We haven't really scraped really hard against that root surface because um, if you do so, you might be scraping off healthy periodontal ligament cells, okay? So just try to keep it as intact as possible. And this is the Essex fitted. You can see how the Essex is shorter than the gingival margin. We want to keep that um, free for a wound, open wound closure, keep it free of pressure. And this is five months later. A few things to look at. Um, we have lost a little bit of buccolingual volume, which is fine. This is uh, expected. But the good thing is the lateral incisor is still there. Probing is good around it. The papilla is maintained. The central papilla is maintained as well. The color of the tissue is good. And we have a nice closure of the graft, which is fantastic. Again, here you can see there's a little bit of collapse of the tissues. It's just because it was a massive bone loss. Okay, We have a big distance between the central and the lateral and just the lip pressure in the area and external pressure is, is causing that graft to kind of um, migrate a tiny bit palately. From a 3D view, we can see that we still have enough bone for an implant. And the beauty of this scan is that you can see that the lateral incisor apparently has perfect bone healing around it. You cannot see that defect any longer. So hopefully and eventually that's going to be newly formed bone to keep that tooth stable long term. We're going to place our implant. You can see in this case, the bone is a little bit more immature than on the previous ones I was showing. It's just because it was a large, large graft, okay? It's gonna take longer for the bony cells to grow into that graft and mature up that, 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 that bone graft and create a new cortical plate, but still we were able to stabilize the implant. There wasn't too many um, loose particles here. Another key aspect here is our incision design, okay? Remember, um, I, I like to preserve papillus if I can. But also, the, the first crestal incision is not in the center of the crest, but it's just far or as far palatal as the implant will be going. So that when we place our healing cap, all that extra tissue that we have mobilized from, from palatal to buckle is going to add more bulk to the tissue in the buckle. Again, we needed to add a boost to this case because we, we, we have a little bit of uh, tissue loss, hard tissue uh, shrinkage there. So we're going to place our connected tissue graft sutured underneath the buckle plate, oh sorry, the buckle flap. We suture everything. Here again, you're gonna see the adaptation of the flaps was a little bit more challenging. It's not as good as previous cases you were seeing. So we can expect perhaps a little bit of scarring. And this is three months later. So we very, very nicely reestablished the, the buckle contour. There's no more concavity any longer there. You can see it from the occlusal view. Again, very, very nice buckle contour perfectly re-established and established and aligned with the other central incisor. And that's a before and after. And now I imagine every single one of you looking at this presentation will be thinking, that looks like a barrel. It's not a great tooth. Well, I'm showing the before because you can see clearly there was a diastema there. The patient, um, he wasn't really keen on doing any cosmetic work on the adjacent teeth on the, on the other central incisor to widen that tooth and have a more harmonious result. So he told me, look, um, why don't we just finish up the case like this? You fill up the space for me because he didn't want to ask him either. Let's look how, or let's see how it's looking like. And then we can always decide whether or not we trim that tooth a little bit. We add some more bonding or, or veneer or whatever on the other tooth. And we, we make them more symmetric. But he was happy. That's how the tissues are looking when we fitted them. Okay. Um, highlight or, or, or key aspects is that this tooth papilla is, is there. Okay. We haven't lost that papilla. We remember the dramatic bone loss and, and, and the tissue loss we had there. So the tooth is, 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 is kept, the papill is kept. The gingival margin is, is, is good as well. This is the occlusal view, again, nice volume. And this is one month later. So after the blanching goes, the, the tooth is not looking as bad again. It's looking a bit better. We can still see a tiny bit of scarring, okay? But I think it's, it's really important to analyze our cases. And most people, when they smile, they will show up a papilla, even if they have a low lip line. But a lot of people, unless they have a very high lip line, they will not really be showing this scar tissue. So if we just put everything on a balance, I much rather keep a papilla and have a tiny bit of scarring than compromise my papilla, especially in a case like this where I was more, more than likely to, to run into troubles if I was going to elevate that papilla. In the occlusal view, you can see that the, the, the mucous gingival margins are perfectely aligned. The tissue color is perfect. The case is doing great. Lateral view, again, very happy with the result. 
And here you can understand why the patient was happy with the tooth. He didn't really have the need or feel the need of, of getting those two central incisors to be the most symmetric. He was happy. You can see the distal papilla is visible in the smile, but the scarring is nowhere to be seen. So happy and into a complex case here. And um, again, we're going to go to, through the pros and cons of this technique. And I think that uh, if you're going to graft in a case like this, it's interesting, interesting to graft early before you allow for the tissues to collapse. By doing so, you're going to try to keep your, your tissue profile, your tissue bulk, the, 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 the buccal contour and the papillas as intact as possible. So it's one of the biggest advantages of this case. We're going to keep the soft tissue architecture by doing so. One miracle at a time or one little step at a time. So I think that for a clinician that's starting to undertake these kind of procedures, it's probably the better way or the safer way to go, safest way to go. Do our graft first, have our bone ready, then do our implant. And we can also check our GBR or our guided bone regeneration before we place our implant. So when we are doing our implant, that's going to be the, the ultimate test. We're going to see if we're doing, we are doing things right. We're going to see if our bone is integrated and... Um, if that's if that's not the case, that means that we're missing something. So it's a, it's an opportunity to to make sure that the bone is there to stay long term, and then finally we can also add soft tissue during the implant placement. So if we end up running into a little bit of soft tissue, uh, sorry, a little bit of our graft has migrated or a tiny bit of a buccal deficiency, we can add some add some soft tissue, and that's going to be enhancing our final result. And then, well, the disadvantages of, of this procedure obviously are that we have two surgeries. Okay. Um, and the time. It's probably from, from the three options I was presenting initially, which is the immediate implant, the early implant, and the delayed implant with the socket seal or socket um, uh, repair. This one is the one that takes longest for sure. And with this, I just want to thank you. And um, if anybody would have any further questions, feel free to, to use my, my email. You can uh, share your cases with me or, or anything like that. And to finish now, we're going to jump onto the, the Q&A or the questions and answers. And we're going to check if, if anybody has any questions there. Okay, so I see um, a question there from Thomas. What is the suture you used and what size? I, I already explained this. Perhaps the question was done before. So basically, we're using a 5-0 monocryl. That's my preference. I like to use this suture for all my bone uh, grafting procedures. And uh, it works very, very well. It's a long-lasting resorbable suture. It's a monofilament, also important to, 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 to understand because um, it's not really swelling or it's not... Um, it, bacteria and plaque will not really adhere onto it. When using zero bone in extraction sockets, would you advise to mix the biomaterial with autogenous bone chips? Well, this is something I never do. I never use a bovine mineral bone into an extraction socket into a, a site we're going to be placing an implant into because we're going to end up having less vital bone as this bone will not remodel it just stays there as a scaffold bone grows around it but it doesn't really resorb so when i'm going to be placing an implant into a socket i'm going to or i want to have the maximum bone amount of vital bone possible so i'm going to be using uh, an allograft now i know that in some countries allografts cannot be used okay so People are obliged to use Zerabone or, or similar materials. So in that case, perhaps most for sure I would be using Zerabone and just adding a little bit of touch in this chip. But the challenge here is that if we're going to be doing uh, a flapless procedure, it's not easy to, to harvest a touch in this chip. Another question in, in following the same um, line, really, is it better mass graft than Zerabone to preserve alveolar tissue? In my experience, when I'm using Max graft, I can re-enter much quicker. And when I do so, I find a tissue that looks very, very similar to bone. I use autogenous bone for my, some of my bigger cases. And when I use in max graft, I can actually see that you know, the tissue that I find is, is quite similar to that when I'm, I'm using autogenous. In the other hand, if I'm using Zerabone, um, loose particles, non-integrated gram materials are, are a very common finding in my, in my hands. But I think it's a good debate. A lot of people still use uh, Zerabon and, and BIOS and, and similar materials. So another question, can you name the name of the bone graph used? It's from Botis, and all of the cases I presented today have were done or completed using MaxGraft cortical cancer particles. And uh, it's sold, I think, in 0 0.5 grams and one graph. The bigger cases, 
like the last one I was showing you probably was using maybe a couple of grams of bone. In the smaller cases, one gram is, is more than enough. So it looks like the questions are all over there. Anyway, if anybody has uh, any further um, questions, you can always use my email address. So another question, um, note that you enter at four months with MaxGraft. How much time should you enter with Zerabone? Um, I think probably eight to nine months at least with Zerabone. Just um, understand that when we have a bone defect, the bone defect is going to be always supplied with new blood vessels and, 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 and bone cells from the host bone up into the defect. Okay, So if we have a material like Zerabone, which is kind of an obstacle, it's going to be a space maintaining material, but it's going to be also an obstacle to, 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 to normal bone formation. It's going to take a lot of time layer to layer for your new bone to grow all the way up to the top. So I would wait at least eight, nine months. But in my experience, I've waited a you know, long time in, in, in some cases, and I still sometimes find that uh, those loose particles, and it's just because our barrier function is gone after three months. Three months later, we don't have any, any JSON membrane in there, so that barrier function is gone. Well, I think with this, uh, we would conclude the, the presentation. There's no more questions. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. I hope that you take home some, some, some good tips. And um, it's a technique that really, really works well for me. And I just wanted to share with you. Thanks very much.